What's up, Foundation? What's up, YouTube? And it's me, your big partner, Cartoon 53. Listen, y'all been asking me a whole lot of times about the interview with my homeboy Spark. A lot of y'all been wanting to know about Blue No Crip. I got that interview for y'all. Check it out. It's kind of long, but listen to it. It's very informative. So anything y'all want to know about Blue No, here it is. What's up, Foundation? What's up, YouTube? Man, it's me, your big partner, Cartoon53. Man, I'm here with a person that everyone has been trying to hear from. They want to know his story. They want to know his background. They want to know what he got going on. And it's the man, the myth, the legend himself. This is the homie Big Spark from 120 Raymond. Um, I'm going uh, to let the homie introduce himself from, uh, from this point on. Homie, let the homies know who you are. I'm Big Sparks, man, and first of all, too, man, it's a blessing that you came in, man, and uh, wanted to sit down and, uh, and, and 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 interview me, man, and ask me some questions and stuff, man. So it's an honor and a pleasure. But I am Big Sparks, original Raymond Avenue Crip, original Baby West Side Crip, one of the founding members of the Blue Note Crips in the penitentiary, a Crip through and through. Uh, and the reason I was cripping because it is a movement, man, I strongly believe heavily in that can evolve and make a, 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 a statement with us as a people, man, that no other can. So that's the reason I'm doing this interview. That's the reason I was cripping. And any questions Mr. Toon, my homeboy Conrad, has for me, man, I'm going to try and fulfill that with the best of my ability. Shoot, homie. Okay, homie. Uh, first question, how old are you? I'll be 65 uh, in September. That's right, that's right. Are, now, are you originally from L.A. or were you born someplace else? I was born at John Wesley Hospital, Los Angeles, California. Okay, so you're you from the beginning to the end. 9959. Were your, were, your, were, were your parents from here or for, were they from uh, different states? Well, no. Yeah, my parents, one, my mother family side was from Texas. My father's side was from Sweetsport, Louisiana. Man, that's a trip because a lot of the homies that I talk to that are in their 60s, between 60 and 60, 66, I'm going to say up in there, most of our parents, it's a trip because my mom was from Texas and my father, my father was from Louisiana too, you know? Yes. So it's just like, you know, how everybody migrated. Mm -hmm. um, what schools did you go to? Uh, I went to... West Athens Elementary School, Century City Elementary School, um, junior highs, I went to uh, Henry Clay, uh, then uh, was subsequently uh, expelled from there and had to go to schools outside of the district, uh, went to schools in McCormick for a minute, McClay Junior High, San Fernando Junior High, came back uh, right around the time of uh, when I came back to LA, after being problematic in my youth like that, I was uh, basically graduating from uh, prison camps and, and camps in Wyatt. Okay, okay. You know, back back during them time, that was a, that was the rite of passage. You know. Yes. Um, t tell us what was it like growing up in the Raymonds. Uh, well, I originally started out on the hundred and fifth. I've been on the west side most of my whole life. I started on the 105th and Normandy, which is currently UG territory. Um, and then um, my parents, we was in an apartment on the 105th. Then my parents, uh, probably in 1968, moved to 120th Street. And uh, it was just a you know lower, a lower class, lower middle class neighborhood. It was it, at that point it was still some uh, Caucasians uh, scattered about a few Asians and uh, uh, African Americans was was starting to push west from the east, uh, and uh, slowly but surely that whole neighborhood became basically predominantly African American. And in about 19, I got there in 68, I say 1970, 1971, it was 100% black, maybe 90, no, 99.9% black. Mm -hmm. Everybody moved out. White flight. That's right, white flight. Now, let me ask you this. A lot of people that are from different states or just don't know, 
they hear the uh, they hear the word Raymond Crip, and a lot of them come up under the impression that this was uh, the set from Raymond Washington. Could you explain to them how that name came about? Well, in part, in part, Raymond Washington uh, was a minor factor in the determination of uh, uh, being Raymond Avenue Chris, but not entirely. So, uh, Raymond Avenue Crips came about in the Raymond neighborhood, which was primarily a neighborhood on the west side in between Normandy, Vermont, Imperial, El Segundo. The reason it came about because 1973, 1972, uh, setism started in Crippen. It was a trend. Um, UGs came out, Hoovers came out, Q102 came out, uh, Block neighborhood. It was a, it was a, like a, a, it was a, it, it was something that, that caught on and spread it real fast. Grandies, Compton's. Uh, so in my neighborhood, it was a combination of Baby West Side Crips, UG Crips, Block Crips. And uh, we decided to have a meeting. I called a meeting in, uh, at, in, in, a, in a central location in them areas I just explained to you. Called a meeting and I uh, told, we pretty much agreed, 90% of the people that was at the meeting agreed that we needed to be a set instead of having all these different sets written all on the wall. People, my home, whatever, with the, one of my best road dogs, uh, uh, was a was a uh, a UG crit, but I was a baby West Side crit, and his name used to be right next to my name in the same zigzag alley with two different hoods. But this is my own boy. So we we got together with all the people that was in that neighborhood, uh, gathered them up, had a meeting, made a determination we're gonna be called Raymond Avenue Crip. We kicked every name there was. Normandy didn't sound right. Vermont Crip didn't sound right. Buttline Crip didn't sound right. Um, we hung out on Raymond Avenue in 121st, shooting dice, drinking a little beer, doing what we do. Uh, and uh, so I decided like, you know, we, we about to start a new set. We gotta introduce this stuff to the bigger home at a bigger crib meeting at some point. Even it's a process. So we yeah, we can come up with a, a, a set, a name. So we used to kick it on Raymond Avenue. I made uh the suggestion in the meeting. I was like, you know what? You know, Big Raymond, he's in I think Raymond was in prison at the time, I'm pretty sure he was. I say, you know, we go to the crib meeting and introduce ourselves at Raymond Avenue. They're gonna associate that with the big homie, with the Raymond Washington, you know what I mean? At least I know if Raymond, you know, we put in the right kind of work and we represent this Crippin the way it's supposed to be represented, he wouldn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the thought process that went into deciding that we're gonna be Raymond Avenue Crips. Primarily, we hung out on 120th, 121st, on Raymond Avenue, we was we was in need of an identity and a set name. Everything else we was coming up with that day didn't have a, the ring of cripping to it, uh, but just RAC did, and that's what we went with. So um, I remember you speaking in another interview when you pre when um, the homie Big Raymond had, uh, got out and you presented it to him. What was his reaction? Uh, well, he had actually heard about it. I presented it to him. I had actually met Raymond uh, at the skate ring prior to the crib meeting at Sentinella Park. So that's the first time I ever met Raymond Washington was at Rosecrans Skate Ring. Or, or, you know, it was me and Skeet from Shotgun together. And I was introduced to the brother, which was a pleasure. I was a young, you know, crib and uh, heard him, you know, a ton of things about the brother. And so, that was cool. We went to a crib meeting probably a week later um, uh, to honor Ricky Silas and, and, and to uh, talk about, you know, what might have happened with him. Man, we lost that crib soldier under mysterious circumstance, and uh, we had a big crib meeting at Sitting Park. So 
we decided we'll take that opportunity to, to address Raymond after the crib business was over with, and I did. I walked up to him uh, with a blue rag in my hand and told him, you know, look, homeboy, uh, I just want you to know, man, we're from the west side, and the name of my set is the Raymond Avenue Crips. And he looked at me and said, yeah, homie, I done heard of y'all. You know what I'm saying? I like what y'all doing, and I love that motherfucking name. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, boy, you're going to come to love it even more because we're going to do this quick. That's right. You that's know? right. And, yes, from, from that, and from that point on, man, it, it was no looking back, huh? From that point on, it was no looking back. It was a lot of challenges. We, we on Raymond, we made it a decision to, uh, to keep our, our hood um, solid, uh, tight, organized. We went with the expansionism that a lot of uh, crip sets were, uh, were, were so hungry and eager to participate in. We modeled ourselves after the, basically the, the 113 Black Crips. We looked at their model, and we tried to imitate that as much as we could. Mm -hmm. Big Hulk and them. Big Hulk, Big Odie, Melvin Hardy, the original West Side. Mm -hmm. Crips. Mm -hmm. no. So as time went on, as time went on, and 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 Raymond 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 jumped on the scoreboard real tough because I knew when uh even when I was a youngster, and I'm I'm way way on the east side. Um, I would hear about the Raymond Crips way over there because I remember as a child, the first time I heard it, I thought it was a set that was made up behind the homie Raymond Washington. And then, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. But as I start, when I start going to Juvenile Hall and Y and stuff, and I start running the homies from Raymond, they, they kind of hit me to the skip. I'm like, okay, because I did, you know, with it being well on the west side, I didn't know it was a Raymond Street over there. Right. But that's yeah. what's up. So as time yeah. went on and you start, you start getting into the bigger and bigger and bigger things. Um, did it come a time where you knew that you was heading to jail? Oh, but jail was, you know, like, I wasn't a smart crip, first of all. But partly, you know, we, we, we grow up and we ain't knowing that we suffer from uh, self-esteem. I mean, we, I mean, I was a youngster. I was 15 going back and forth to jail like it was nobody's business. I mean, I was down to fight, squabble, shoot and kill. Just about anything walking that wasn't crip. You know, that included anybody with a badge just like a dude with a red rag to me at this point. So jail, and then jail was something that basically I didn't care about, man, because truth be told, they was feeding me better in the goddamn juvenile hall than I was getting in my house. And not, not only that, I was anxious to see what I was working with against all these other factors in Los Angeles. And the best way to see that is when I went to juvenile hall I see the toughest Mexican that was in my pod. I want to squabble with him. The toughest Don Moore, I want to squabble with him. It was just a, it was, it, it was a testing, it was a testing ground for, for, for gang members, man. So it was something that we did. It was a lot of us that was doing it. And uh, I did it with the best of them. So yes, I was going back and forth to jail, doing my thing with the Crippin. And not necessarily out of a, a a want for reputation or or to uh you know to uh you know to, to, to put myself above and beyond everything it's just something that we did i grew up fighting in my neighborhood i wanted to see who it was out there that can best me at what i did and know i did well okay let me ask you this coming up who were the raymond's main rivalry the, well the main the raymond the main rivalry coming up was Two down moon sets was Demo Lanes and the Athens Park Boys. Later on in the game, uh, the Mellon Gangsters came about. Uh, but we went everywhere with everybody, and you know we 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 did a little bit of uh, pushing the Brams back with the overall Crip community. That was uh, the real focal point for Crips as a whole coming up was the L.A. Brams. But in that area that I was in, it was the Denver Lanes and the Athens Park Boys. And although it was Helen Kelly Park Boys before the Raymond Avenues took that park, they wasn't so much a factor in uh, being an adversary like the APBs and, uh, and the Denver Lanes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So when that first, when that, when that lightning struck, I, when, I, when I mean by when that lightning struck, the first time... It was when when the laws finally put their paws on you, and you had to go do a stretch. How old were you? Well, I did 
two wide stretches and I did maybe two uh, camp. I did two camp stretches and I did two wide stretches. Oh, so you went through the whole gambit. Oh, yeah. I went, <laughs> I went, to, I went to camp twice. I was in uh, Munns and, and Keller Patrick. Uh, and then I went to Y uh, in 75 and uh, finished with my YA stretches between the both of them from 75. I finished my last one in 1980. So about off and on, it was about maybe three and a half years of my life from, um, uh, I say from 15 to 20 uh, going through YA. So you a YA baby like me? <laughs> yes, I am. Started at Nellis, ended up at YTF. So... After YTS though, it was time to it was time to kick it up a notch. What what yeah, happened actually, with that? It was it was so. I mean, it's a funny thing happened to me in YTS, man. Is you know that I started reading books. Uh, I started uh, you know I'm growing. I had a my first child was born on my second stretch. Uh, I was growing up and and my thought process was uh, evolving the same. So I read a book. Uh, by uh, Lucky Luciano, called the True Testament of Lucky Luciano, while I was in YTS. And I was like, you know what? You know, I was a criminal to my heart, through and through, period. I didn't have no, uh, no, 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 not even a, a smidgen of, uh, of uh, civility and, and, and doing the square drones at this point in my life. So I was like, you know what? I know a few killers out there, you know, I mean, these, this, uh, this organized crime seemed like it was something that uh, I could, you know, I could, I could really embrace. And so I came home from YA and, uh, and we turned it up on a, you know, on an organized level. We started having these meetings. We started talking about, you know, collective uh, accounts and monies and, and, and doing things on a level uh, that take us all to where we wanted to go. So with when 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 that when that state of mind kicked in, the only the only the only thing that was standing between you and a penitentiary was the headlights on the police car. Yes, sir. It, the only thing that stood between me and the penitentiary was ignorance. Right, you right. That's what I'm saying. You know, like I said before, man, I was I was uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't your I'm not a criminal mastermind. Uh, you know, I might be a a. Uh, a true blue crip, but uh, far from being a criminal mastermind. And then, you know, I was dealing with uh, uh, a lot of substance abuse that was going on in my life. I mean, if I, I drank a quarter of motherfucking beer, man, I ain't, every time I had drunk a quarter of beer, it ain't not a one time that I can decide that after drinking that, I'd have made a real smart decision. Right, you know right, I mean? right. So let me ask you this. What, um, what what end up what what end up bringing you to prison? Oh, so um, one day I was out in the street, man, and uh, well, my crime, uh, well, my neighborhood was uh, like we we not going to even talk about the overall thing. Let's just talk about me personally. Mm -hmm. um, basically, man, I got uh, they wanted me off the streets, and I was accused of of. Uh, First of all, it was a, it, my crime was I, was, I had a crime partner with my brother and this dude named Walter Fontino who snitched on us. Uh, and what happened in that crime is uh, an individual got gunned down unnecessarily behind a struggle over his van and uh, uh, it was a lot of convoluted stuff going on, you know, uh, the lady said I shot him. The snitch said my brother shot him. It was, uh, they still think I shot him, and my brother is still sitting in prison right now today. Okay. Um, without, without, without going into a lot of the details on what took place and what happened, so eventually when, when the smoke cleared, you, uh, you were sent to prison for, a, what, attempted murder? No, I was sent to prison for life without, for murder robbery. Life without. Life without. I had a L one. Oh shoot. Okay. My That's something got, I didn't even know. Yes, my brother got fifteen in life. I got. Uh, well, they wanted me off the street. Yeah. They gave, you me, off. they gave me. They gave me a L one, and uh, 
That's how I started my prison sir. Now, for those out there who don't know what LWOP means, LWOP means life without the possibility of parole. Exactly. When they give you that, they basically are telling you, look, go in here and we'll let you out when you die. And that's a hard sentence. That's a hard pill to swallow right there, y'all. It's a death sentence. It's a death it's sentence. It's a death sentence without going to the gas chamber. That's right. life without me. Right. So, so when, you, when, you, when you finally went to prison, you went up under those type stresses, right? Yes, I went to prison up under that. I was 22 years old, man. But, uh, uh, you know, and I had two children at the time. So uh, it was really a, 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 a traumatic thing at that point in my life, knowing that I'm about to leave these two, uh, these two angels out here in these streets of L.A. with me uh, going to prison and, and, and making that my life. Because I, I seriously thought that that was going to be my life for the rest of my life. So how old were you at the time? I was 22 years old. I was 23 when I hit the yard at the same point. 22 years old with life without parole. Life without parole. Man, but you did it like a soldier. So let me ask you this. What was, what was when you first, when you first went, did, well, first off, uh, the was the crib module around in the county jail when you first got locked up? Well, we, we the ones that created, first we had the Red H module. When I was there, it was called the, the hostile module. They gave us wristbands with a red H on it. We was at we had one tier on 4300. That was uh, the crypt that was uh, too recalcitrant, just a little bit too aggressive, too aggressive, too aggressive for the for the female. Hold it up, just a minute. So yeah. Um, yeah, basically, man, uh, you know, went to, uh, we went to the county jail, and uh, at that point, the Crips was really, it was really an expansionist thing with the young uh, youth in, in, in L.A. and California, and the Crips, at this point, man, was, was pouring into uh, the county jail at, at record numbers, and uh, we did what Crips did up in there and made everybody understand that these are a group of, of a little young black uh, that is uh, a breed apart from everything they ever knew about in this country. And we demonstrated that daily. So, yeah, we, we started out with 4,300 before it was ever a Crip module. We, we started, it was a bunch of, I can name, it was... It was a lot of us in there. So we filled up that whole little top tier. Uh, after that, I was sent to junior high power. I, I got kicked, you know, I, I, they got me up out of there. I went to junior high power, which was a, a, you know, a place where they just put somebody where they just, we had blue wristbands. So I put, I was put in junior high power and uh, did that for a while. They couldn't hold me there and Probably five or six months after that, they put me in what they call high power, uh, 1750, to try and contain me in my crib. Uh, from high power, I went home. But during the time that I went to high power, they did start the first crib my joke on 3100, and it was just two tiers. And then they sent them, uh, I went to prison in 1983, uh, the Crips, they continue to pour in. They end up getting a whole module in 4,800. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. And of course, when yeah. for those who know, we know 4,800 wasn't nothing to play with. No, it wasn't. So eventually you end up leaving the county and going to what, Chino? I went to Chino. Went to Chino, did a little check-in, and from Chino, uh, hit San Quentin. I hit St. Quentin in 1983. By June of 1983, I hit St. Quentin. And, uh, and then that's where I came into a, another brand of Crippen based on the politics of the prison yard. Okay. So now, of course, we finna get into this. Now, Foundation, I know y'all y'all out there listening, and a lot of, a lot of times y'all ask me, well, Toon, we want to know about Blue Nose. We want to hear about the Blue Nose. We want to hear about Blue Nose and CCO and Blue Nose and Blue Nose. Because, of course, y'all know I'm a Blue Nose. Now, 
And I keep telling y'all that eventually that I was going, you know, put the information out there. So y'all ain't got to quit asking me and trying to figure it out. If anybody can speak on Blue Notes that can give it to you from the beginning to the end, from the rooter to the tutor, it's this man sitting right here in front of me. He was our general. And I'm going to just leave it to him. Yeah, so the Blue Note Crips, man, came about uh, in 1984 in St. Quentin. And it was a, a, a situation where uh, a lot of Crips uh, were uh, basically torn between uh, being Crips and being revolutionaries. Uh, the Crip model for organized Cripping at that point was something that the CCO had a stronghold on. So organized Cripping was Crip Consolidated Cripping. It was, that's what it was. When I got there, uh, I liked what I saw. I, I'm not going, I like organized. I like organized Cripping. Structure. I like, I like structure. That's who I am as a person. Um, but anyway, uh, one thing led to another, and the homies on death row, namely Took, Evil, Tretch, uh, that was there before me, and, and Avalon Don, who was my celly, uh, Big Frog from A Trade. It was a little, the consolidation wasn't that old between the, uh, what the St. Quentin car, which is the West Coast car, and, uh, and the Blue Magic car that came down from uh, Saladad. That's how you got it. That's the Consolidated Crip Organization. Those two organizations. Uh, but, uh, and I like, you know, I, like I said, I, you know, I, I'm naive. I don't know uh, about no revolutionary structure. All I know is Crip, and all I know is Blue Rags. And I know all these people, most of them, the vast majority of them out there, you know, out there uh, with the caters, you know, the exercise, uh, the structure. Uh, so, I'm all in. You know, that's point blank. You know, what we need to do, you know, to go forward. But, as uh, as would have it, um, people got to get into my ear, you know, uh, Crips that I was uh, raised with, uh, out there uh, battling in the streets with, uh, Crips that uh, put theirs on their line, I put mine on my line for them, uh, felt like that wasn't what Crips supposed to be. Basically, the big homie is the main influence on me. When I say the big homie, I mean my big homie was uh, Tookie Williams. And uh, when he got to writing to me uh, about what he uh, felt about the CCO, uh, I, I, I had to, I had to, uh, I had to uh, turn my back on that, on that type of crypt, and I did. Uh, not only that, I think at the crypt meeting, either, so I was at two crypt meetings with Raymond. I was at one in Sydney, I was at one in uh, at Will Rogers Parkway, and I don't know which one it was, but he spoke on, on uh, his uh, disgust and. Uh, and hate for uh, the BGS behind what they tried to do to him. And he was just giving us a head up about if we go to prison to, uh, you know, just to, you know, battle with them dudes if they come at you. And that's that's another frame of mind that I always had. So I didn't know how closely aligned the CCO and, uh, and the BGS were, you know, with, as far as the ideology is concerned, uh, until I, you know, got to read a little bit more. People got to get in at me, and I seen the correlations in, in, in organizations, and uh, I'm like, no, I can't do this. I got to, I got to, uh, I got to keep mine blue rag. So one thing led to another. Uh, we decided, uh, a bunch of us decided that we needed to uh, to have some structure to survive. You know what I mean? Because. Uh, uh, CCO uh, wasn't taking prisoners, you know. I mean, it, it wasn't no situation where we was afraid. Like I say, man, I grew up with most of them. I knew who they were. I knew what they was working with, you know. And they were just running around with a couple of knives. Uh, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't too impressive to us. So we 
decided we needed our own yard, our own identity, our own crib um, structure that represented, you know, the spirit and soul of Raymond, Ovie, Melvin, Tookie, and the second generation of, of uh, Crips coming out of the east side and the west side of the country. And so we decided, man, you know, hey, man, we didn't want to, but we decided that it needed to be another structure, man, based on that, man, and Crippin, period. So we came up with, uh, with the blue note, which is, uh, the blue note is a harmonious note, and we wanted Crips to be in harmony with who they were. We wanted Crips to, uh, you know, carve out their, their own road and identity towards who they really were. And we didn't believe that we belong in the 60s revolutionary struggle. We didn't, we didn't, no, we wasn't against that. Uh, but if you wanted to go to that, you go to that being a BGF or Vanguard, black folk. Don't go to that being a crypt because that ain't what we were doing, that ain't who we were about, and basically who we were and what we were about is defined by our OG homeboys. That's who is the directors and the and the and the uh, the conductors of this crypt machine as a whole. Not not the ideologies of the '60s. It's, it's crypts is a whole new breed of uh, of brothers, man, doing what they do against all lives, man, right? and. History has bored it, you know, history bears that out, you know. They're here today, they're not going nowhere. That's right. Let me ask you this. A lot of people always ask me, Toon, was Big Tookie a blue note? I'm going to let you answer that. Of course. Come on, man. Everybody know. Big Took was, 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 was so, all, so basically, man, all Crips, man, that wasn't CCOs was blue, was blue notes, whether they, they wanted it or not, because... Uh, they either had to be a CCO or a Blue Note to survive, right? So if you wasn't, if you, I mean, when I say that the, all Crips was Blue Notes, I'm not saying all of them was under paperwork. That that's a that's I don't want you to get the wrong impression by that. The Blue Notes wanted to target Crips by merit to incorporate them into their paperwork not by the numbers like the CCO was doing. Uh, but the Blue Notes welcomed to their yard all Crips, but didn't necessarily want all Crips into the inner folds of what they were doing. They're a little bit more uh, secretive and we thought that was a, a, little, a bit more effective for what kind of Cripping we wanted to do uh, was about. And, and uh, as, as it works out, that's exactly what happened. So, yes, all Crips that wasn't CCO was welcome on Blue Note Yard without no kind of, uh, you know, nefarious, you know, motives about them. They was took and care of. They didn't have food. We gave them food. They didn't have uh, necessities, toothpaste. We took care of that. We educated them. You know, we, we, we taught them how to read, write, math. Right, um, right. Gave them military science, prison military science. Taught them how to make candles, knives. Uh, taught them how to use those knives. You know, uh, taught them, you know, who to get, when to get them, uh, how to get them. So we was we was doing that with the idea that we're going to organize Crip according to what Crip really was. And that's how Blue Note came about. A lot of people... They want to know about the about or if there was or about the conflict between Blue Notes and CCOs. Yeah, the, the conflict came about uh, basically, man. First of all, you got two solid um, entities the, because the Blue Note surreptitiously came about. Uh, under the under the nose of the of the CCO. CCO CCOs didn't know the blue notes was being formed really. Uh there was a lot of blue notes right there, you know, in their circle. And they didn't know that. Uh, but um 
once they were formed solid and ready, um, they made themselves known to the CCO. And the CCO, uh, being who they were, you know, they, they, they were the big bullies on the block. Just trust and believe that. Um, so once they found out that, hey, it's another crypt entity that's circling around these prison yards, um, it was something that Blue Nose was willing to live with, but CCO uh, had their ideals about other crip organizations. This is either you CCO or you're nothing, you know. So we had uh, we had our falling out. We did, uh, and we you know we went to hitting each other, beating each other around on the heads, and uh, uh, the episode that came, the legacy that came from that, because that one. I, I, I'm a, I'm a crip that knows where when Crips was Crips and we all had each other's back, East Side, Compton, West Side. We all trusted each other to be there in the middle of everything. The CCO and the Blue Note conflict or war, whatever you want to call it, destroyed that trust. The only the only thing left behind uh, that bad episode in Crippin was these down ass crips on both sides of the aisle that used to be brothers. Now we don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. And that right there eroded crip to an extent that we got all the sadism, we we, we, we we doing things outside of who we were in the beginning. And that right, I, in my opinion, that war between the Blue Notes and the CCO really had a uh, negative effect on Crippin as a whole because now Crips don't trust Crips. Right. You know, Crips basically, regardless of what side you want, it's just that simple. And you, now you got home boys coming in talking about they ain't gonna be with neither side. That's bad. That's right. even worse. Right, right. You know what I mean? So uh it, it, it wasn't no uh it, it was a war that we thought was necessary and I'm, I'm sure the CCOs thought was necessary. Uh, but it was one uh, where I'm, I'm proud of, of what I represented because I represented the Blue Rag. And, uh, but it was one that I regret also because I knew some uh, Crips on that side, man, that, uh, uh, you know, I'd give my life, I'd give my life for, you know, point blank. And it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a real uh, setback in Crips. I can agree 100% with you yeah. because when, when my indoctrination to Blue Note came, um, what I had got from it, what I ran with, and what I took to my heart wholeheartedly, I immediately had a disdain and a dislike for all CCOs. Um, it wasn't nothing you could tell me. Um, it wasn't nothing that you could try to convince me of. All I knew is they were the enemy. Get them. And when I first started coming to prison, that's what I was on. Get them at all costs. You know what I'm saying? And like you say, because of the distrust, it, it, it put a big rift in between the trust of Crips, you know? Yes, it did. And it's regretful. Because we really do need that. We need that trust back. We need that, that assurance that when I'm with uh, another Crip in an in a adversarial circumstance, I, you know, I, it used to be no question that that Crip was going to ride or die. Uh, now these Crips can say, oh, this, this nigga's a blue note. I'm not. Fuck him. You know, let uh, let him suffer the consequences. Or worse than that, you know, niggas now saying this. You know, he's one set or another. Nah, y'all need to bring it back together, man. This shit is over with. Uh, we need to find a way that uh, we can get back in a circle together and be uh, and be the warriors that we really are. You're right. You're right. You're right. And and one thing, one thing for sure. Um, you know, coming in, coming in as as a, as as a blue note, like I say, you learn to you learn to dislike CCOs and you learn to dislike BGF, and like I say, I took that wholeheartedly. I ran with it, it because it was what I was taught, it was what I held on to, and it what it, it it just was what it was. But now, one of the things that kind of blindsided me was the the dislike and the distrust you would get from homies from your own birth set, you know what I'm saying, that, were, that weren't under paperwork, when they did find out that you had something to do with Blue Note or CCO, they wanted to treat you like you had the plague or something. Right. See, 
you probably didn't have to go through that being for Raymond and Raymond Cripps being the backbone of Blue Note. But you, I know you've seen a lot of distrust coming from other people toward their homies when they found out they was on the paperwork. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and we had, Raymond, we had you know, by and large, the leadership of uh, the Raymond Avenue Crips, the sports that was on the street. Yeah, they all, the police had a, like a dragnet in our neighborhood because uh, uh, we were doing too much. This is, it, we're not going to go into no details, but as a young set, uh, the powers that be wanted to wipe the leadership of that crip organization, you know, off the face of the planet. You know, ergo, I got this, uh, you know, got this, this, this punk ass case with really no evidence, and, and I ended up with a life without a sin. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, yeah, well, yes, I did. We did have Raymond, but you know, so my set was, was a tight knit set. Real tight men, and yeah, most of them uh, fell like step into their leadership in prison, in jail, and uh, you know, yeah, became the backbone of one of the primary movers and shakers of this ideology called Blue No Crip. Uh, that don't mean all of them did, because we did have um, CCO rank. You know what I mean? There was CCO, but nine, let's just say 90% of the Raymond Avenues uh, were Blue Note. Mm -hmm. And even if you wasn't a CCO or Blue Note, the fact that your leadership was Blue Note, you was going to be considered a Blue Note, right. whether, whether you liked it or not. Right, you right, right. You right. from Raymond. Right, yes, just because you were from Raymond. <laughs> but yes, we had, we had crips from... Uh, from basically every set in the greater Los Angeles area and beyond, San Diego, Pomona, we had Crips uh, in the Blue Note from all this basically every set. We had at least, every set got a Blue Note in. If you, mm -hmm. if you got a set out there, you thinking you ain't got a Blue Note in there, uh, you, you, you in Wonderland. Hey, tell them again, Mike. There's, there's, there's a Blue Note in your neighborhood if you Crip. Right. So, yeah. but yes. Uh, I seen the whole uh, uh, fallout behind that. You know, most homeboys come in with their cricket, you know, they wear that on their sleeves. I mean, it's a serious business, man. And they, they was out there giving their life to this cricket. Right. And when they step into another realm like the penitentiary and got to deal with all these uh, uh, things that they don't know about or not understanding, it causes them, real good brothers, to step back from even their own homeboys. Mm -hmm. You know, niggas they've been knowing since sandbox, you know, knowing their heart, knowing they, they they mind, knowing this motherfucker here is a real truth, but nonetheless, because they feel like he's with something that he don't understand or know about or he thinks it's scandalous because of all the backstabbing and stabbing going on between these groups. It, 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 it's a real phenomenon. Yeah, you got homeboys from your set that you gonna be with when this was going on. Now, I don't, the penitentiary is different today, but when this war was going on with the CCO and the Blue Note, yes, man, it was an ugly thing to see, man. Ugly. Homeboy, homeboy come in that you know is your homeboy, but he he steps back in a corner somewhere like you got to play. It, it, it happens. It happened uh, regularly, but by and large, most homeboys trolls one side or another and took up on. I got um, I ain't lie. It's 2024, and I got I got some homies still right to this day. We don't communicate. We don't have nothing to do with each other because I was under paperwork and they didn't understand it. And they would always, you know, you can't be. How you going you gonna turn your back on the set? You can't be from two sets and that. Uh, and that, you know, I used to go through the thing and try and explain it to them, but I got to the point to where you know what. Hey, homie, feel what you feel. You know what I'm saying? I'm blue note. You can accept it or reject it. It is what yeah. it is. One of the first things I did, I got out in 216. I had a meeting at a Helen Kelly Park. And yes, there's a lot of that. It's, it, you know, uh, hey, Crips is Crips on the street. They, they're not in there reading these revolutionary books and, and having these structures and communication networks and dealing with bigger issues. So one of the first things I did and tried to get across to those that was having these problems with, you know, uh, Blue Note and Raymond Avenue Crippin. I, I assured them uh, that Blue Note and the Crippin that y'all doing out here is consistent with one another. 
Blue Note wasn't doing nothing but going up against things that was getting in the way of what every crip out here on the street was doing. But we was doing it on the prison yard and we couldn't do it under Raymond Avenue. It was a losing strategy. It, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have panned out right for the Raymonds that was just standing up against this uh, organized structure. Mm -hmm. But I told them, so Blue Note was, was Blue Note and people know who was Blue Note and who wasn't. But by and large, Blue Note Constitution was one where you don't reveal to anyone that you're a blue note when you was in prison. So, um, I used to, I just told him, man, look, man, I used to have multiple crip meetings on the yard with a bunch of different crips. And they all knew I was a blue note, but I used to introduce myself as Sparks from Raymond Avenue Crip, every crip meeting I went to. So, it is not, because I didn't see the inconsistency with what Raymond Avenue was doing, what Avalon was doing, what Compton Crips was doing, what great 60s who was, I didn't see the inconsistency with my blue rag and blue noteism and what the Crips on the street was pushing. Although we wasn't with the, you know, the gang, I mean, the streets has own, you know, we, 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 we know elements in the streets is different from elements in prison. But we wasn't with the, the you know, Kill of blood, seal blood. We wasn't with the gang banging per se, but we were with anything in prison trying to deny me the right to do what my homeboys was doing. And we was dealing with those factors that was trying to squash those elements of crip. And we had to be organized. We had to have some harmonious crips working together that understand what the what the you know what uh what the stakes were. Right. And, and uh once we once we communicated with homeboys that was uh of the uh, aptitude mentally to deal with what we needed to do as Crips, everything went well. I had a um uh, you know speaking on how you were saying about what people know and knew and didn't know, um I had a dude I knew for many, many years in prison and um you know, years go by, years and years and years go by, 10, 12, 15, whatever. And um, he found out I was a blue note. He was like, Tune, man, I never knew. And I'm like, yeah, homie. But what about when we was, I said, yeah, I was one then. Well, why you never said, I said, no, we don't do that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, no, it, it, we, our, our edict was, no, we're not finna pronounce it, put it out there like that. Because, you know, I got it tattooed on me now, but when I first came into it, the rule was no. You know what I'm saying? No. Uh, like. It was secret. No, you yeah. find out, you find out, but it wasn't going to be for me telling you, you know? Exactly. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Um, so we fought, man, for about three years with each other. And then uh, uh, the prison, so uh, at, at, in the heart of the, the fight with the Blue Notes and the CCO, you need to understand that it wasn't these new style prisons like New Folsom's. Mm -hmm. It was the old style prisons. And, and the, 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 the architecture is different. So the, the, the way you move is different in prison. You know, we had um, uh, 6,000 people on the yard in San Quentin. Right? You don't see that no more. We was able to communicate with each other through letters and uh, all kind of ways. We used to, I used to be if the tomb was in, Tracy and I was in San Quentin. I just I knew his number, I could write him. All that stuff came to an end. They, mm -hmm. they, they seen that this trend that these Crips were uh, were serious. It was uh, mobilized and they uh, presented a threat. Uh, not only that, it came into uh, right where this tough on crime, politic, white boy stuff came about and you had the prison expansion and then you had the architecture of the prisons with the design of dividing conquering. So you have these new style prisons uh, that was able to, just by design, um, uh, squash our movement. You know, squash not only our movement, but just about everybody. So mm -hmm. y'all might hear about the Emmys and, and uh, Southerners and the AVs and the GGFs and the Van Gogh. Uh, they're nothing like who they were when prison was prison. So, right, right. Um, and we're not. So, 
it, it did uh, the, the, the power structures that be uh, has a has a has a, uh, a microscope on us and uh, and so with that uh, we was able to the blue notes the leadership of the blue notes the leadership of the CCO was able to uh, come together like soldiers and say look man enough is enough right you know let's go our way you know let's lick our wounds and uh let's forge ahead man with a new direction for both sides you know and that's uh to try and bring us back together right right and uh you know what y'all bring to the table what we bring to the table in that regard is going to go a long way towards the next little homeboy saying okay these dudes we went through these wars and these ideologies together if they can sit down at the table so can we you that's know what right. I mean? So that's what we're trying to do. Let me ask you this. Forward. How long How long did you uh, end up doing? I did 35 years. 35 years, yeah, man. I did 35 years in prison. Uh, started out with life without. Uh, uh, they tried me as an aider and a better, saying, uh, well, they didn't know what the particulars of my crime was, but uh, they tried me as an aider and a better, and they wrongly tried my brother as a shooter. Uh, but uh, they gave me life without with special circumstances because the, the, the death of the victim happened during the course of a robbery. Uh, and uh, uh, the law came out where an aider and a better uh, without an intent to kill uh, couldn't get life without. I got 30, the pillage court reversed my case to 31 to life. Uh, you know, and uh, I walked that off, man, with the That's right. Up. That's I right. Walked, I walked that off, uh, went to board May 5th, 2016, and uh, got a parole date. The board, board released me, to my surprise, and lo and behold, here I am today. You So you got out in 2016? I got out in 2000, in September 2016. Okay. Let, let the foundation know about the programs that you're involved in now since you've been out? Well, yeah, well, I, it, I have a few. Um, right now, and my current focus is uh, uh, a nonprofit that uh, I'm the CEO of called uh, Inglewood Wrapping Arms Around the Community. We located uh, right here on Manchester Boulevard near the Forum. Uh, what we do uh, is provide wraparound services with the idea of bringing our homeboys home and making sure they get the necessary start that they need to strive out here and to stay out here and to uh, uh, be pillars uh, of this community and uh, you know move forward with their experience, breeding that experience down to our youth so that they don't make that same mistake. So as you can see, if you pan around, this is my office right here. Uh, you know, I'm big. I'm big on a bunch of historical black figures, as you can see. Uh, and uh, I come here every day, trying to figure out what I can do to, uh, you know, to better my community. Um, right now, we have uh, what we call uh, chess mentoring program for youth. We just developed that about maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, and uh, I work with a bunch of good brothers from the east side and the west side, and what we do is we, we, we basically bring these kids in, we feed them, and uh, we try to teach them. We don't try, we teach them chess, but at the same time, we're teaching them chess. Each of these brothers that's proficient at playing chess and teaching these kids what the pieces are, teaching them, uh, you know, uh, how pieces move. We we got metaphors for like the long range vision of a bishop. And we, we sit down, we, we, we get the kids into this and we find that sometimes, uh, most of the times that these kids open up by learning stuff and they get to trust who this person is in front of them talking to them. And they come back again and again and again. And we done turned out some pretty good chess players here, some young chess player that is just naturally gifted Mm -hmm. at the game of strategy, of, uh, you know, being a, a critical thinker. Uh, chess uh, provides mechanisms of patience and contemplation that you may not otherwise get with other 
uh, board games, but uh, or with the video games that they they you know that they're into these days. But yes, we find that it is a model that we are embracing and that we're developing and that we're growing in and that we believe will make an impact for the good on a lot of people's lives. And so, uh, if you want your kid to learn anything about chess and its various uh, benefits to their cognitive abilities, then uh, bring them in on Thursdays, man. Bring them, sign them up, bring them in on Thursdays. Um, and uh, have them sit down. Uh, every parent, every grown up is welcome to sit in. And if you play chess, we, we encourage, we, we, you know, we, we, you can play with somebody that's here, like another adult, but we encourage all chess players, adult chess players, and especially those uh, with a background where they were, uh, uh, we're going to say justice involved backgrounds, where they then went through the system, uh, where they got uh uh, natural wisdom that they can grandfather into these kids. Uh, we, we ask them that they put their game aside if they see a kid aside, pull the kid to the chessboard and, uh, and and speak to the kid while teaching them. We also have computers. We have PCs with the chess sets on them and we have these, uh, these Oculus sets with the chess on them that the young kids really love. So, uh, it, it's an innovative approach uh, to mentoring, uh, but we think that uh, it's a sound approach to mentoring. We think that if nothing else, uh, once the kids learn just what the pieces is, there's something that they probably would never forget for the rest of their life. And uh, with that, we're going to try and, uh, and uh, we're not going to try, we're going to build this thing and we're going to get to as many kids and adults as we can. So with that Listen Foundation, y'all just heard a man give his story about how he came up in the streets of Los Angeles, went through the things that he went through in Los Angeles, went through the jail time that he went through in the prisons, 35 years, going through all the wars, the ups and downs, the fights, the stabbings, the, 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 the racial rise, being shot at, the whole hookup that you go through in the California CDC prison system. But still, after 35 years of being subjected to all that, he came home and immediately started giving back to his community. So when you say that gang members in Los Angeles are lost cause, um, they silly, they this, they that, this, young, this man right here, my big homie, he is a glowing testament to what the human spirit can do, to what a person can do when they grow up and they say, you know what? I'm finna help my people. I'm finna help my community. Yes. With that, uh, Sparks, you have any pardon words for the foundation? Yes, sir. Man, everybody that's out there, man, let's all get together, man, on any phase, on any basis, on a positive note, man, to bring our community past all this stuff in America that's going on. And uh, when I mean, I'll say get past all this stuff that's going on, uh, a lot of people are not politically astute like I am, but there's things that's beyond us, that's out of our control and control, in the control of others that we need to be cognizant of, we need to be aware of, we need to be conscious of, we need to be involved with each other, and we need to understand that we only have each other, but that's all we need, that's all we just want. That's real. With that foundation... We gon' sign off. Peace. Hey. Dance the book. Dance the book. Dance the book.